Welcome to AGL Live, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I am Melinda Burgess with AGL. And uh, before we begin, I'm going to start with a little bit of information about our organization. AGL is a nonprofit working to help modernize government through shared knowledge and community. Um, I'll put a link in the chat in a moment so you can learn more. Uh, today, we're here with a fantastic team of panelists to talk about how to make failure and learning from failure faster, cheaper, and more accepted in government. And this AGL live series that we run every other month uh, gathers speakers from local and state and federal government and industry to talk about modernization topics and share knowledge about how to help government work better. Um, we do encourage audience questions. So during the discussion, you can use the chat icon at the bottom of your screen uh, to open up a chat and you can ask questions during the discussion. We'll do our best to answer them. Um, and you can also find out about upcoming AGL live events or past videos at our website, which I'll also chat uh, here in a minute. Um, and at the end of the discussion, we're going to do a book giveaway, which is uh, Failing Forward, Turning Mistakes into Stepping Stones for Success by John C. Maxwell. We thought it was a pretty appropriate book to give away at this uh, discussion. So stick around at the end uh, to find out if you're the winner of the free copy of the book. And right now, I'm going to hand it over to Alexa Choi, who will be moderating the discussion today, and then we'll meet our panelists. Thank you, Alexa. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Melinda. It's always exciting when somebody pronounces my last name correctly. <laughs> Thank you for that. Perfect. Well, everybody, thank you for being a part of TGL. I'm really excited. And I'm going to start it off by having our panelists introduce themselves. So we'll go ahead and get started with Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Bruns. I live in the California area. I work in Sacramento with several different government agencies. Um, I have a, an interesting history about how I got into Agile. I actually went kicking and screaming all the way. I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, was a senior business systems analyst for about 20 years and um, found myself in a certified Scrum Master class and probably two hours into it, um, thought, oh my God, these are my people. <laughs> I think the right way, I don't think crazy. Um, absolutely loved it, I haven't turned back since. Um, I've taken it all the way to becoming a certified Agile coach. I'm also certified in Agile for HR. And so there's some questions coming that I'm looking forward to participating in today. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're going to come around to Rob. Hi, I'm Rob Klopp. I'm actually also in Sacramento. Um, but uh, uh, I'm in Sacramento sort of trying to do some consulting for the state to help them with IT modernization. And I sort of grew into this after having spent some time at the Social Security Administration as the CIO and head of systems there. And, you know, I guess as you can imagine, um, if you've been the CIO of any government agency, you probably uh, have had to, uh, you, you either have failed several times or uh, have inherited some failures. So uh, we'll talk about some of that as we go. Thank you, Rob. All right, we'll move over to Grace. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm Grace Simrall. I'm the Chief of Civic Innovation and Technology for Louisville Metro Government here in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I, now, um, I think a lot of people are um, at this point familiar with innovation officers participating in municipal government, but it's um, still a relatively new thing. I'm the second one for the city's history. And prior to this, I suppose you could characterize my career as one of um, being someone who is uh, inherently an entrepreneur. So I uh, founded my own startup company, um, have been a data scientist and, and worked in IT for the past um, 20 years and bring that kind of background and expertise, you know, uh, operating a lean startup um, to uh, making data di driven decisions into the municipal um, innovation and technology space. I'm pleased to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I love your exposed brick in the background. It's very awesome. Um, and coming around to Vicki. Hi, uh, my name is Vicki Niblett. I'm the Deputy Assistant Commissioner for the Integrated Award Environment at GSA. I'm responsible for um, 10 very large systems that are federally mandated for use across the government for people that are making, receiving, or managing federal awards. So systems that you may have heard of, such as SAM.gov, FPDS, CPARS, and 
FBO, uh, Fed Biz Ops is always one people recognize. Um, so within my, um, my program, we are doing a modernization effort where we're taking the functionality of those 10 systems and building one system um, that contains that basically a one-stop shop for federal, federal awards. But um, for my background, um, I started out my career early on as a contractor supporting NASA headquarters. And there I was an app dev um, branch manager. And that's when I first uh, saw agile development, or heard the term, and um, where some of my teams started to move more from the waterfall type um, development into agile. And, and since then I moved um, over supporting the army. And I would say we had a little bit of a mix of waterfall and agile, but um, moving then over into GSA, it's, uh, I'm definitely running an agile shop here. Awesome, Vicki. And I can tell you from a contractor's point of view that we are waiting with bated breath for this <laughs> one-stop <laughs> shop. <laughs> Everybody's excited. It's actually kind of the buzz right now in the industry. And I've been um, contacted by several people being like, hey, Alexa, do you know anything? And I'm like, why, why would I know? I have no idea when, when it's coming, when it's happening. <laughs> but um, yeah, so thank you for that. And thank you for being here, everybody. I really appreciate it. So we're going to start with question number one, which is uh, story time. Tell me about a specific failure in a government innovation effort. What went wrong? How do you, and, and, and more along the lines of like, how do you know it was a failure? Because sometimes it looks like a failure, but it might not be. So we're going to go ahead and kick that question out there. And I'm going to start from the bottom up this time and go Vicky first, and then we'll go around. Okay, so I can speak to um, failure that, that I faced when managing integrated award environment in this modernization effort. Um, you know, the biggest challenge that we faced, um, especially about, I would say about two, three years ago, when we started our development, we were on a three month cycle. So our PIs were, you know, five, two week sprints with one uh, IP of two weeks. And really, um, we, it, it was we found it was too long so we weren't reaching our objectives for our release and i think it also tied in with the fact of not setting really realistic ips um again we also weren't truly using the ip sprint also as well to do future planning and really doing innovation we were really using that as the catch-up to try to actually meet our goals that a lot of times we weren't meeting um, so I, I can tell you I, how we've kind of faced it, you know, how we've uh, resolved that issue, but I think that'll be the second part of this question. So Sure, sure. That, yeah. That's one of the things that we've really focused on is really the duration of our PIs, I would say, to sum it up. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. So uh, Grace, coming over with you. Absolutely. And I think that um, if anyone's familiar with some of the uh, Office of Civic Innovation work, one of our most celebrated projects is called Air Louisville. Um, and it was a, a really innovative way to, um, in fact, identify hotspots of air quality challenges within our community. Um, but, uh, you know, for what I realized in the media story was that it, they were treating it like an overnight success and they were failing to capture, in fact, how many times we had attempted to be able to measure our air quality and in fact how those were abject failures but we didn't give up we kept pushing at it now you know why was that the case i think part of it is because oftentimes in the innovation space it might not necessarily um your innovation might not be technology based but in our case it was uh the technologies really weren't vetted for an enterprise environment um the data quality of these devices just weren't there and and um you know we learned a lot of lessons as we did multiple iterations around being able to measure our quality awesome that sounds great and rob um, so I think there's two that I'm going to probably end up mentioning as we go through this. The first one is one that I inherited where <clears throat> kind of a classic government, $300 million were spent uh, that was several years overdue. And, um, you know, the contractor was convinced that they were just one release away from everything being right. And um, I was pretty certain that that wasn't the case. Um, my staff also thought that they might be one release away. But you know what I discovered was that they, we we didn't really have release criteria, so we didn't uh, we had a backlog of bugs, but nobody had evaluated the bugs and said these are sev ones, these are sev twos, these are sev threes, mm -hmm. and nobody had set criteria that said 
you know, we might be able to tolerate one SEV1, but we can't probably tolerate more than that. We might be able to tolerate a half a dozen SEV2s, but we can't tolerate more than that. And because there was no release criteria, what we found was the, the contractor was in fact working on bugs, but they were basically knocking out a hundred uh, superficial bugs and uh, dodging the hard ones. When we, when we put uh, more uh, um, objective release criteria in the place, we were able to discover that they were not really making progress. It was not advancing and <clears throat> we were able to call failure on it. The second one, which I'll talk about more, but just briefly mention was that we then started up a brand new project that was completely agile using all modern technology and stuff like that. And about six months into it, found we weren't getting the velocity we were expected. And so we made an adjustment there. And, uh, but again, I'll talk about that more later. Cool, thanks. And Karen. So I'll talk about one of the more recent ones um, and I'll, I'll leave the uh, agency um, nameless for now because <laughs> um, they're still underway and they're still trying to figure out what to do next. Um, I was an agile coach for one of the agencies and um, what we got to see was the teams beginning to grow and, and I know you're going to be talking about culture coming up um, and, and I've got some great things to talk about in that regard but the teams had actually worked together to build a single unified culture. They had um, taken um, great strides in doing so and <clears throat> there was a lot of pressure from outside um, agencies and outside uh, we'll call them the end customer right a lot of change in direction. Um, I think our specific failure was in the number of times that they changed direction and, and quite literally they'd go through um, a PI and they'd get about 50% of the way through the PI and the direction would change. And, um, and from the very beginning, they didn't have um, automation and they didn't have a CI server. They didn't have continuous integration set up without having a pipeline set up and established well-defined that they could deliver software these teams were not able to deliver software and there's you know really nothing that's going to defeat a developer faster than the inability for his customer to see the great thing he's done right <clears throat> and this continued to happen and well into their um, eighth pi they were still changing direction every few weeks um, what this does is it ends off defeating you know the organization it defeats um, the team it defeats uh, anyone who's trying to work in that environment and make a difference, right? And um, as we looked at, you know, there used to be a thing where I, I worked a long time ago, people would say, oh, come on, it's just eyeballs, right? We were working for a, um, Agile and uh, Vision Services plan. And they would say, come on, people, it's just eyeballs. Nobody's gonna die here today, right? And the difference was in the organization that I was working in, in this particular one, you couldn't get away with saying that because we were working on something that was going to help people and if they didn't get a new system, there was potential for death, right? And so it takes on a much more serious um, angle and um, and became real frustrating for the developers. I think the biggest piece of the failure was, um, you know, and I think you find this in all of the different agencies, um, people who are making the decision to embark upon an agile journey, they end off um, going down this path <clears throat> based on a one to two hour presentation, right? Mm -hmm. They don't get the same that the teams get. They don't understand how to get that product, quality product cheaper and faster. They don't understand it's going to take some money up front to build the, the processes and put into place things that need to be done. And I like to call it like the Ginsu knife approach to agile um, implementations. You know, a consultant comes in and they talk, you know, to senior leadership and it's like, it slices, it dices, right? It's going to do all of these great things for you. Yet in the very end, they're not able to achieve um, you know, all the benefits that they heard, right? Um, I think that's where it ends off failing, right? Is when we have leadership that doesn't go to the extreme of understanding what exactly does quality product cheaper and faster mean in terms of cost, commitment, dedication. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. When I went into my first Sprint Zero with an agency, right? And they started bringing up all this functional requirements and what it needs to look like and feel like and all this stuff. And my architect just raised his hand and he said, we need to first talk about non-functional requirements. Do we have our Azure platform as a service set up? Do we have our VSDS set up? Do we have these things in place? We need to build the backlog of just those before we start talking about all these great look and feel and functionality and MVPs and all that fancy stuff because we need to have an MVP on the tech stack first 
before we get into all that, you know, fun stuff. So I think Karen, to your point, that's, that's absolutely critical sprint zero type of stuff has to be done first or else you're just not going to go anywhere. But that was, that was a learning point for, for, I think, um, the customer. And that was like the first time they've ever heard of that. They were pretty excited. Um, so yeah, great guys. Thanks for that. And we're going to move into the second question, which is how did you pivot into a better direction and learn from the failures that you guys had mentioned? And how is the outcome better in the end? And I'm going to, um, instead of calling on each panelist, I'm going to throw that one out there and let you guys take it from there. Okay, I'll start. I mean, the, the big $300 failure was a giant waterfall thing. You know, I, I, I don't, it's not my experience that big projects fail because the process is bad. I think that they fail for much more difficult reasons than that. The process can help you identify the failure sooner, can help you maybe head off the failure, but, but the fundamental failures I mean, if, if you do waterfall poorly, that doesn't mean you you fail. If you do agile poorly, it doesn't mean that you fail. It just means you don't get all the benefits of the method, methodology. So, um, so you know, what I would say is that um, in this $300 million thing, what we discovered was that there were some really fundamentally difficult problems um, that the business had not probably come to grips with and the contractor probably didn't uh, identify around product ownership. And mm -hmm. in our case, the product owner was every state and four territories. And those owners weren't perfectly collaborating together. And the, uh, the vendor, I think, made the mistake of thinking that the right solution was to um, satisfy everybody's requirements independently. And that was probably an impossible problem to solve when we basically said back and said, wait, all 54 of you have the same fundamental business process. Let's figure out how to go find the minimum viable product that is the core of that business process and, and then bring you all to the same process instead of trying to solve every, instead of believing every individual gets to declare their own requirements. Um, we were able to fix that. And then <clears throat> on the Agile one, and this is probably way more important than what I just told you. On the Agile one, um, uh, this is a little bit hard to describe in words, but, but you know, software guys have been taught to decompose problems um, into chunks. And so Agile is supposed to be incremental. And so <clears throat> you just decompose the problem into chunks. For example, the first thing I'm going to do is ingest an application. And the second thing I'm going to do is uh, check basic eligibility. And the third thing I'm going to do is look at a particular claim and, you know, determine whether that's eligible. And, and you have these, you know, in a business process, 10 or 12 chunks that you go through. But, um, but if you take an agile approach that says the first thing I'm going to do is deal with ingest, you're not really solving the business problem. You're just solving a chunk. And so there's a much better way to do increments that says, what if I took the simplest case, <clears throat> the happy case, and I solved it all the way through, through all 10 phases. And so instead of slicing the problem horizontally, you slice, or instead of slicing it vertically, you slice it horizontally. So for example, in our case, we had, you know, 40 or 50 different claim types and we found that if we solved the first claim, the easiest claim time first, all the way through, that we could actually roll that into production and people could use the modern system to actually solve these simple claims. And then we solve the next most complex and the next most complex. And that, that there were significant advantages in <clears throat> actually having increments that delivered real life value to the business. Um, as opposed to decomposing the problem in a way that sort of made more sense to engineers. So better direction was take a horizontal slice about around the problem instead of a vertical slice around the problem and deliver the in, a simple version of the entire business process into production as we went. It was really powerful. That's, that's actually a very impactful statement. Um, delivering value faster through thinking in a different way right that's right yeah i like i like that that's good awesome perfect uh who wants to go next 
So can I piggyback a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. On Rob? So one of the things um, I saw within, um, with our modernization effort, with taking 10 different systems, um, you know, the knee-jerk reaction with our team was to start, you know, go re rebuild the functionality of FBO. You know, go, then we'll go and do WDOL, and then we'll do stand back up. So they were thinking of it more of a system by system. But we really, we, we did a really big pivot about three years ago where we said, let's stop thinking of them as separate systems. Let's really start thinking of it as one, you know. And, um, you know, we stepped back and we said, you know, these 10 systems, they're, you know, input, you know, data is going in, data is going out, you're doing system administration, APIs and such. So we looked at the common functionality across all of these systems and said, let's focus on that. You know, our first real big goal when we put out our beta.sam, our first production release was, let's provide the ability for our users to search and view on public IAE data. Instead of let's let them do everything they can do in FBO, let's let them have, you know, the search and view capability across all of our data. So I think that was really powerful, that decision that we made where we moved across. And I, like I said, I'm piggybacking off of you, Rob, um, on, on, you know, what you were saying. Um, so for us, I, I think to go back to my original comment of our, our struggle with our PI duration and our length, um, what, what, we, what we did is we, we did that pivot, but we also were looking at our objectives. Um, so really focusing on what needs to be done to bring the biggest thing for our user. And, um, and we, we did quite a few things, but one of the things is we shorted, we um, shortened our cycle. So now instead of doing three month cycles, we're on, you know, six months, uh, six months, not six months, six weeks of development. And then one of IT where we're not having new requirements come up in the middle anymore. Like Karen, you mentioned as well, like we're in the middle of a PI and, oh, well, we forgot to do this. We forgot to do that. Um, so shortening it has, has helped us because we're defining our requirements and what we're focusing on, our objectives, and it's there, we're reaching them a lot better than we were um, in the past. So I, I've seen our velocity really pick up and our users are, are really benefiting because they're getting little chunks of actual product that's valuable to them. Mm -hmm. Which I think is one of the Agile Manifesto pieces, right? It's like deliver working software. Is that one of the things we're doing? That's one of the things we're supposed to be doing, working software. Awesome. That, that chunking it out horizontally, I mean, yeah. just thinking of how you're building it, I think is very important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Vicki, I, I don't envy you because you have a lot of different stakeholders that have different needs and um, a lot of different <laughs> people that do different things with the data, right? And, and so um, it's just man what a colossal undertaking being one of those users I can just I can't even imagine <laughs> all right perfect coming over to Grace Grace would love to hear your answer on this one yeah and I think um, I want to point out that modernizing government also includes not just modernizing IT but even the innovation side around emerging technologies and so as I mentioned we discovered back in 2014 these low-cost um, air quality sensors that were coming out on the market just had um, were abject failures. I mean, we probably should not have purchased hundreds of devices before testing a few. Um, we discovered through our testing that, for example, they couldn't do things like navigate our DHCP. They, um, their data quality was so poor that if we put them next to our EPA grade air mo quality monitoring stations, not only did they not agree to the station, they also did not agree to each other in any way that we could correct for the data bias. Um, so we, we pivoted, we tried a few other ways to, to use low cost sensors and we realized that, again, back to what um, Vicki and Rob shared, sometimes you just need to look at it in a different way. And so we said, how about let's right size the problem and approach it in a different way. Um, what we really care about is in fact the impact on our residents. And we know that the ones who have um, chronic respiratory conditions are the ones that are kind of canary in the coal mine and they, they signal to us where there are challenges. If we were to ask residents to opt in and share their data of when and where they were having asthma attacks when they were using their rescue asthma inhalers, that would be a really different way. We'd have residents or citizen scientists as proxies um, at getting the information. And sure enough, we found ready and willing participants, over 1,000 residents, 1,147, willingly opted in to share their data with um, government and with a private sector company to be able to collect this data so that we could impact policy decisions. 
Wow, that is so awesome. I never thought about that. And when it comes to the proxies that you didn't expect and, and being able to loop them into the process, um, Rob and Vicky, that's a really an interesting thought, right? Like who, who wants to be guinea pigs? Who wants to kind of be a user group? <laughs> um, that, I, I like that. That's awesome. Thank you, Grace. I'm going to come to Karen. Karen, instead of answering this question, I did notice that Mateo had asked a question up here from the audience. Um, he actually asked two questions that, that were very huge and could probably be their own AGL Live, e either one of those. Um, but I think the first question is something that you might be interested in if you wanted to take that one rather than answer this one. It's up to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so first, Mateo, thanks so much for asking that question. Um, as an Agile coach, culture is something that I'm super focused on trying to uh, get the people piece right in an organization because if we don't get the people piece right, the technology doesn't come. Um, <clears throat> so what has worked in government um, in the past is, um, and I'll, I'll talk about a different client now, um, Child Welfare <clears throat> did something fantastic. They, um, they brought together every single person that would be involved in um, their organization. And when I say their organization, I don't mean just the project. I mean anything that this project would be doing. They considered every piece of, of the project, the finance, the, and this is kind of ties into your second one as well, um, <clears throat> finance, the procurements, um, every single facet of of the organization, even the social workers. They brought social workers in um, to serve. So this also kind of bounces off of your other question too that you had just a minute ago. Um, <clears throat> when when we bring everyone together and we have give them an opportunity to define what does this team look like? We're talking about the entire organization. We talked about what are the things that uh, get in the way of a team, right? Um, things like the team dysfunctions, you know, how do we recognize certain behaviors in people and how do we safely call it out where the person isn't feeling um, that they're necessarily being called out, but more brought into accountability. Um, it's, it's an entirely different mindset. Um, one of the things that we do is we build everything that we do off of the Agile principles. So um, there, I've got some great exercises that I'd be happy to share with um, AGL if, if you have the ability to share it outward. Um, that I'd be happy to, to share that. So let me know, um, Alexa, if that's something that would um, be helpful to our viewers. Absolutely. Um, if you, yep, Melinda's giving double thumbs up. So I think you should, if you can share in the, either the chat here or if you send it to Melinda, she'll send it out to the people that had signed up for the panel um, as a follow-up with the, with the link. Yeah, I'll send sure. it to Melinda separately. It's um, quite a bit. So, <laughs> yeah. so, um, so one, of, one of the things yeah. when it comes, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I, I didn't know if you were wrapping up. Uh, one of the things, uh, speaking about culture and kind of going to what you were saying, is I went to visit uh, CMS recently, and one of their components is super duper agile, but they went through a really tough transition to get to that point. And the first thing that they did when I walked in the door was said, let me walk you around our collaboration center. It's so awesome. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. That sounds cool. Um, and so having a collaboration center built to suit their needs kicked off their whole culture it was awesome and so i kind of feel like that's something the government could probably use in some spots uh it's, it's just kicking it off with the collaboration center having a space where they can go and and have it built out to the needs that they have and, and i think that kind of goes well, that's Thank part you. of it right that's definitely part of it because um if the people own what's happening then i mean that's the best way the best approach 100 percent so, uh, you know, just one quick weigh in on the cult. You know, the, my problem is that, that, that uh, when you ask the culture question, a lot of times people um, uh, think that this is a boil the ocean problem. And so they go, oh my God, I have, to, I have to take on the culture question before I can go do agile uh, because it's a complete change of the culture. I actually don't believe it's nearly that difficult. I think that you know, it, it, engineers want to engineer effectively. And if you just, if you just start and you just do it um, and you, and you don't get too hung up on the, on the ritual of agile and you focus more on the gist of it, which is user stories and, and two week review cycles and product increments. And, and, and after every product increment, rethinking the priority of the agile stories if you just focus on the gist and just go do it i think that the culture follows so it's not that i disagree with anything that was just said about changing the culture i actually think those are all correct and important 
but but I think that it's it's the wrong thing to ask the question about changing the culture as the first question you ask because you can spend years trying to figure out how to deal with cultural change and instead of spending years just using agile to go engineer and fix problems but but by the way i'm an engineer so <laughs> why i'm not one right makes sense perfect um thank you for that rob uh that's mateo's second question is actually one that i think i want to take instead of my next question down here so question two he said it's focused on um focus on the gap between a government agency doing the agile thing and in the government world around which it does not speak agile nor does it measure things in agile ways so I, i'm assuming that he's referring to the contracting office <laughs> just assumption so uh how do you bridge that gap there um that's a great question grace i don't know if you wanted to kick this one off i know that um state and localities you guys also you know have have to talk to people work with people that might not be as on board with the agile processes as you might be or the innovation process or any of those things um and so if you wanted to kick it off well i think that it's um i i think what rob said before was absolutely reasonable part of what you you have to do is not expect that you will transform all of your processes especially around contracting and budgeting into agile overnight um, but to get those quick wins, because what uh, inspires confidence in lawmakers and and those who appropriate budgets is um, is evidence, and so you you can get stuck in this really terrible chicken and egg problem where you you know you tell them well I think we need to do this and they say well but that sounds risky do you have any evidence for that and you say no because I have to do this in order to collect that evidence in the first place, um, so instead of expecting to to you know die on the sword for those types of uh, for every single fight, um, I think there are opportunities for you to be able to explain, we're running this pilot, it's time bound limited, where we identified the risks, we are managing the risks, we're taking smart risks to be able to learn and feed into the system and get those wins. That's really important and it starts changing everyone's perceptions, especially when they do see, um, you know, maybe their false narratives being challenged, meaning that, you know, there's this all sense of confidence that if we have extreme specificity and these RFPs written in just the perfect waterfall way that'll perfect you know protect us from, from failure when well we've we've seen projects or inherited projects that are that are that way and, and we then fight against some cost bias so um, so I think that it's very much a, a yes and approach you've got to be able to um, pick where you can win those battles and, and start to build up the evidence so that um, people feel much more comfortable with the processes you're, you're um, proposing. I, yep, I absolutely agree with you. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, Rob, I think you had something to say. And then Vicki, I'm gonna to come to you after that because I know that your particular project is sitting in front of Congress and they're extremely aware of it and you probably have a lot of eyes on you. So I wanted to have Rob go and then coming to you to see how do you manage those super, the hot seat over there. Sure. So, so I think that you know the, that the the, um, the the first guys that have to know something about this stuff are all the oversight agencies. So, you know, in the federal government, it's OMB, it's it's General Services, it's it's the Congress, it's you know your own uh, agency or de departmental oversight people. It's the Inspector General. All those people you know, have grown up in a culture of waterfall that says, okay, you've now given me a, a Microsoft project thing that says at, you know, 2.42 on September 30th, you know, 2020, you're gonna have the following five features implemented. And, and that's how they do oversight. I think that in Agile, um, uh, the first thing I'll say is that you have to, you have to prove it to them. You're not going to walk in and show them an agile manual and they're going to go, oh, now I get it. So you actually have to execute and you have to do it. But I think that, you know, we're talking a little bit about product increments and sprints and stuff like that. I think the idea is that that in every product increment, you basically say, here's the hundred user stories I'm going to get done in this product increment. Um, and you probably say, by the way, in the next product increment, here's the hundred that we think that we're going to do. And maybe in a third product increment that's to follow, you say, here's the hundred that maybe we're going to do. And then you start to create a track record of actually getting those things done. In other words, you, you show them that you're making progress. 
that you have velocity and that the, the progress, that the direction that you're going is being controlled by the product owner, not by the IT guys and not by the contractor. And all of a sudden they start going, well, if the product owner is happy with the direction and, and I can see that you're making progress, um, all of a sudden I, I'm comfortable with this. And by the way, I'm also comfortable with the fact that when you now go to the second product increment, you said you thought you were going to do these hundred user stories and you come to me and say, Hey, we're agile. We've decided to take these user stories out and put 10 different ones in because that's really the gist of agile. And in the third product increment, maybe you say, gosh, I took, you know, now we've, it's, you know, that's six months later and now we've made some other adjustments and we've decided there's some other things that are more important. Um, and they, they're, they're, they become comfortable with the fact that, that you're not cutting stuff out and delivering less, you're changing what you're delivering, but you're still delivering the same amount. And so, you know, there's a, some trust building that has to go on there. Um, but what, is, what I think you have to do in order to build the trust is you have to make some agile commitments mm -hmm. and then you have to at least get close to delivering on those commitments and show a track record of making those commitments and, and then it all actually starts to fit together and people, you know, will trust you and go with it. I also found that a definition of done developed by the government uh, seems to make people feel comfortable. Yeah, but uh, Agile basically denies that you can do a definition of done. If you think you've got a definition of done, it's not Agile. <laughs> really. A minimum viable, right? Even minimum viable product is something that changes Agilely as you go, right? Um, you know, I think that the, yeah. the day that I knew that we had won in our first large-scale Agile project was the day that the, the product owner came to me and said, hey, you know, we've insisted that all of these things have to be done in the minimum viable product, but now we're kind of wondering if we, uh, if we cut some uh, user stories out of the minimum viable pr project, does that mean we could deliver this into production, a product increment sooner? And we said, absolutely. Well, you know, yeah. When has the business <laughs> ever cut sc stuff out of scope? Right, right, yeah, right, yep, absolutely, yep. Um, so, so again, even the business has to learn to trust you on this stuff, right? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. And Vicki, I'm coming over, coming over to you on that one. Yeah, yeah so I, I guess I have a few points here. Uh, to pick up uh, where you were, Rob, I think it is important to build that trust and to, to deliver and show that when you say you're gonna do something, you're at least hitting close enough to it. So, um, you know, one of the things, um, you know, I, I get my strategic direction from the 24 CFO Act agencies. I have quite a large governance body and have strong oversight from OMB. Um, one of the things that I started um, quite a while ago is having quarterly meetings with all of these stakeholders, on, on, starting with the government side. And uh, we also hold them on the industry side as well, but on the government side, where I'm bringing all of these people together and laying out and set, really helping to set realistic expectations for them of, you know, this is what we can accomplish in the next three months and, you know, in finer detail. And here's, you know, for the next six months. So as you get longer out in the roadmap, it's harder to really pinpoint the exact date of, you know, system retirements and such, which is from the Congress side, what they're actually looking for and the IG and all, all of these other people that are, um, you know, providing oversight for us. But I think, um, you know, just having that meeting and, and over communicating to our stakeholders of this is what we're working on. This is what you should expect. If you want something else sooner, or you want to reprioritize, let's work together. But a lot of it is involving them as our users, really, these stakeholders as our users and getting their input as we go along, but making them aware of what we're working on, what we're committing to, and um, also, you know, committing to a shorter period of time where, you know, we're focusing on this, we're, we're, we feel very strongly that we can hit these goals, but, you know, a year from now, this is what our target is. And, you know, me going every three months and keep updating them and saying, hey, you know, a year out, you know, six months ago, I said a year out, we were going to hit this, but now that we're six months closer, I think it's, it's changing a little bit. And, you know, just having that ongoing conversation, I feel like has been really helpful and it's, you know, it's building their trust in us. Um, you know, when it comes to Congress and when we go and do our congressional briefings and, um, you know, all of those fun activities, 
they, they aren't asking us, what are we delivering in the next three months? They're asking me, when am I finishing this effort? I mean, I've yeah. promised it at this date, and why haven't you met that date, and where are you? So it is a challenge where, you know, I have to go and explain, this is what we've delivered, this is what we're reporting out, this is our focus, and these are our targets. Of course, when we come back, we'll refresh you. But to me, that has been a challenge, and um, to getting them to understand how we're doing our work. Um, you know, one more one more point to back it all the way up to the to the smaller, you know, to the more immediate, you know, with the COs and how we're doing our contracting. We have spent a lot of time, you know, training up our COs and you know, letting out contracts that are, you know, we're contracting for development capacity. We're not contracting out for very specific work. So we're leaving things open and we're doing our contracting um, you know, in a more agile way. So I guess my point is, as we get, you know, closer in, you know, to the center of the people involved, of the people putting out the contract, we're helping them to get more, um, to do contracting in an agile way. When we talk about our users and our stakeholders from these 24 CFO Act agencies, they, I, I am so surprised at how they've embraced, um, you know, how we're doing this in an agile manner, where right now, if they have um, requirements, or they go actually into JIRA, and they're entering things in there with us. So we awesome. have small groups of users from, you know, CCB working groups where they're going in, they're helping us prioritize. So I guess my point really is, 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 you know, getting them more involved in the process so they understand what we're doing and they're, they see the benefit of it. They are seeing this little chunk. They can go and, uh, you know, do something they haven't been able to do. You can go into beta.sam.gov right now and search on a solicitation number and, and you'll grab the opportunity that comes up. Right now in FBO, you can't necessarily do that in the legacy one. So they're seeing the benefit slowly and slowly, and I think that's giving the trust, um, their, the trust that they, you know, building the trust they have in us. Perfect, Vicki. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to answer Tim's question. Tim Nolan, thank you for joining us today. He's also an AGList, um, one of our group here. And to the panel, he said, have you ever worked with an agency that did not accept failure? And I'm going to kick that over to Karen. Um, and Karen, I want to roll that question into question four. And I think because you have experience in Agile for HR, so interesting how Agile is taking over the world. Um, but this Agile for HR piece, and how do you make Agile more accepted? And do you change performance evaluations or reward risk taking? Um, so I, that kind of, it's all wrapped into that one question of, have you ever worked with an agency that didn't accept failure? And how do you support them in kind of getting them there, I guess? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. The duty statement, um, or I like to call it the almighty duty statement, has to change. Um, um, CWDS, Child Welfare, they actually did a really great job of um, reconstructing, taking a good hard look at the duty statement and making agile duty statements. Um, I'm actually super proud of them for doing that. It gives people the ability to fail. Um, and you, you have to change. This is part of that culture piece, right? You've got to be able to change to if failure is okay, right? I had somebody ask me one time in a training session, when is failure never okay? I said, well, there is one time, right? If failure is okay all the time, then when is it ever okay? Well, there's one time it's never, never, never okay. And that is when you don't learn something from it, right? You don't use it as an opportunity to, to do better and move forward. Um, the organization has to adopt that entire mindset, um, the, the understanding that we're gonna give this a try. Um, one of the most powerful things that you can do in the organization is ask the teams, well, what do you think the best idea is, right? Um, the teams have a lot of ideas. They've got a lot of um, mindset on this. The duty statement, they can tell you how it needs to be modified. Uh, performance evaluations, reward systems, all of those things need to be reviewed um, and, and looked at from, you know, the perspective of will this support an agile organization, right? Um, one of the times I went in and, and I was introduced to the, the teams and um, there was a question from the back of the room and that was, does my bargaining unit know that you're asking me to be agile? Yeah. Well, the response that was given was, it's in that 5% otherwise defined, right? Um, but when you're asking an organization to adopt the agile mindset, it's not just 5%, it's 100%, right? And so we have to take the focus on that. Um, every single department that you interact with, I mean, I used to lobby for, let me just get it at Congress for five minutes. I'll make them agile. <laughs> I'll teach them, you know. You um, might need just more to, than five minutes for that one. Right, yeah. <laughs> let me just get in for five minutes. 
have that conversation about why it's important, right? There's so many different things that we can do, um, you know, as coaches, as leaders, to be able to help organizations move forward in these things. And, um, you know, the duty statement, HR, all of that is, is just part of it, right? Right, right. And I think um, whenever people hear Agile, I think a lot of people think Scrum. They do, um, yeah. which, which, is, which is funny, and it's great. And I mean, it, it, Scrum is a framework under Agile. That makes sense. But so is Kanban, right? And sometimes Kanban fits better, and sometimes Kanban within Scrum fits better. And so I think, like Rob said, just starting and, and, then, and then failing and reiterating, that's what it's about. So why not get started today, Congress? <laughs> we, we actually, in one of our things, we struggled a little bit and couldn't figure out how to get the velocity up. And so for one product increment, we just switched from Scrum to Kanban. Yeah. And interestingly, what we discovered was that uh, Kanban worked better for sort of the infrastructure user stories and Scrum worked better for the business user stories. And so we actually, I mean, we were pretty agile about agile. We actually switched that fundamental thing right in the middle of a project and you can do pretty it. Ag pretty agile about agile. Melinda, there's our tagline. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. That's great. Thanks, guys. So we're coming up on about five minutes left. So I wanted to, before we wrapped it up, I wanted to kind of get from everybody that all of our panelists, and I, I don't know if Grace had to drop off, but I wanted to get from everybody a list of um, tools or tips or anything that we can share with the panelists as, you know, something that you go to quite a bit. So for example, there's a book called Fun, Fun Retros, which is kind of something that a lot of people use. Um, so Vicki and Rob and Karen and Grace, if you're still here with us, uh, is, are there any tools or uh, tips that you have for the panels, the panels, I mean, not the panelists, but the audience? So, I mean, I think it's been mentioned earlier. I'd, I'd like to reiterate, I think that you, it's critically important that you use um, what is now sort of being called continuous integration tools. Yeah, but, I see but, but I don't, you know, people tend to get kind of their heads wrapped around that and think that that means that they're going to roll things into production five times a day like Netflix does. The, I think the point of continuous integration tools is that you get automated unit testing and automated acceptance testing. And every time you check code in the library, those tests run. And mm -hmm. so it, it uh, dramatically, I mean, really dramatically increases the quality of the code that you're developing. And uh, in, our, in, in what I would say our biggest success at Social Security was, our release standard was that over 90% of all of the code would go through an automated unit test. And there's actually profiling tools that will not just run the tests, but profile the code to make sure that which lines of code are tested. Sonar cube, and, right? That's that right. One? Yep. Sonar cube. And, and you know, for the, I would say that the, the integration tool you need to use is something like Jenkins, but there's some other um, Circle CI and other products that do the same thing. And then, you know, we also said that 70% of all of the code had to go through acceptance tests that were actually built by the product owner. Mm -hmm. And um, we rolled out, I mean, really a gigantic system that did disability determination. And in the first uh, several weeks of the rollout, we had uh, seven bugs and five of them documentation. Wow. Uh, wow. That's it's dramatic. Awesome. That's yeah. that is cool. Thanks, Rob. So I guess I'll jump in here, and um, you know the the tip I would have is to get out and listen uh, to more people and hear what people are doing out in industry and government, and um, you know get the lessons learned from them. Uh, that's one of the tools that I use a lot. Um, I've been looking across. I work closely with USPTO. Um, a lot of the other agencies, because I am, you know, in the government, but I, I, I go out and I look at who's doing large efforts like I am and how are they doing agile development. And, you know, with, with USPTO, for example, I think they're doing an excellent job with their um, dev DevSecOps. And I've been really, um, you know, bringing them in, having them talk to our team, hear how they're doing things, and that's been very valuable for us. So, for me, I, you know, just look around. Don't, don't just open the book and see how it's done by the book. See how people are taking it and modifying it and how it's actually being used and, um, you know, valuable. Absolutely. And if there are other government people here, um, your contractors that work for you probably also have contracts at other agencies and could probably connect the dots pretty easily. Um, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
Perfect. Thank you, Vicki. And Karen, I know that you're going to send some stuff over to Melinda as far as um, different um, materials. I am as far as different tools go, but um, if there's one tip I could leave you with, it's don't forget about the people. Um, the people are the ones that are building the software, they're putting it together, and if we leave them behind or we try to imply, um, impose change too quickly upon them, we can end up with something called change saturation, and that pretty much shuts down the entire organization in which it's um, alive. And so um, just remember the people, take care of the people, um, and, um, you know, and don't go so far from, you know, it doesn't have to be pure Agile, right? It doesn't have to be pure Scrum. It doesn't have to be pure Kanban. Do what's right for the people, do what's right for the organization. I have a much more pragmatic approach than the purist. And so I would say, you know, look at it from the whole perspective. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, Melinda, I'm going to hand it back to you with like two minutes to spare. <laughs> Yeah, this is great. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you, panelists, for this great discussion. And we'll be capturing uh, these resources and tips in the write-up following this. We'll be publishing the video uh, so that everyone can benefit from this. Um, and before we do our fun book giveaway, I just wanted to piggyback on what um, Vicki was saying as far as the most important thing being to look around and share information and resources um, so that we can all do better. Um, that really is the mission of AGL. And as a recently launched nonprofit, we do have membership opportunities available. So if you want to support our work, be part of this community, help us share, share your learnings and resources, there is a link in the chat where you can learn more about that and join. And now, we're gonna do our book giveaway. And so I have some, a randomly drawn name here. If I call your name and you're here and you want the book, say hey, and I'll connect with you. Um, so Nancy Wright, you are the winner. And if you are listening, say something in the chat or tell me that you want the book. Congrats, Nancy. <laughs> if we need to find another, oh, there she is. Yay. <laughs> Great. I will you and you will get the copy of failing forward uh so that will be fun um thank you everyone for being here today and we will be circulating the video thank you panelists everyone have a great day